And you write these two very distinctive voices with Leah and Jean. And I was hoping that you would read possibly um, two sections from their point of view so we get a sense of how different the voices are and then talk a little bit about why you made this choice to write from different points of view. Could you do that Thank for us? you. Yes, yeah. yes, and I'll, I'll give you just a, a little background. So um, as Stephanie said in her intro, it's very much a mother-daughter story. It's also about stepmothers and how in some ways I think that we often treat step-parents as some sort of seen sort of suspect in the way that I think sometimes we treat rural artists as suspect, as seen as somehow regional artists or folk artists, and they're not granted and seen as seriously as maybe we would see urban artists, which was something I really wanted to write about. And so when I was doing these two sections, and I thought, how was I going to keep these two characters in my mind to hear them really differently? And it came down to syntax, and I think that this is true, Angie's and I, you know, we both moved back and forth between Pennsylvania and New York, that there's like a self-correcting impulse and so I wanted the younger narrator for her generation to constantly be correcting herself and sort of like modifying she was saying and nervous about using the right word and she's sort of very inhibited that way, even in her own voice. And for Jean, who grew up in another generation, she doesn't filter at all, no filter. And, um, and how could I recreate that in their voices? And how does that difference in the way that they speak end up becoming sort of an impasse between them, between Jean's impulse to feel as fully alive as she can, and that filtering herself feels like it's a, a, something she's not willing to do. And then Leah, who grew up, you know, in another time, and is constantly filtering herself. So you'll hear in this syntax, that, you know, that there was something of that's like a, you know, looking at the answers that people gave. I could even see that and how how they spoke. So I'll I'll read the two narrators. It, the book opens with um, with Leah, the younger narrator, who is. Um, driving across Pennsylvania, a drive I've done so many times. This morning I read that repeating the name of the disease can quiet the mind when grieving for a complicated person. My stepmother Jean was a complicated person. I've been reading all kinds of advice since hearing of her death. I didn't know that she'd begun to weld metal towers in her living room, towers so tall she needed a ladder to complete them. Apparently that's how she died slipping from one of her ladder's highest rungs. Jean never left the town where she was born, where I was also born, and where she became the closest version of a mother I've known. It's a town in the southern Allegheny Mountains, which have been sinking for millions of years and resemble rolling hills now more than mountains. I know uttering Jean's name won't quiet my mind any more than saying the word mountain will stop these hills from sinking further. My use of the word stepmother while soothing is wishful thinking too. Jean left my father when I was 10 and hasn't technically been my stepmother for decades. I've gone through phases of calling her up, seeking her contrarian take on things. Just as often, it's felt saner to stop all contact. In the past four years, we've had none. Despite this prolonged recent silence, she left her towers to me. I received the news from a man named Elliot who claims he'd been living with Jean for some time. He was reluctant to elaborate on the phone, beyond explaining that he was at the hardware store when Jean fell from the ladder. He drove her to the hospital, he said, as soon as he found her unconscious on the floor. I'm driving toward Jean's house now, trying to give this man the benefit of the doubt, to imagine him grieving for her as well. Early this morning, I rented a car near my building in Long Island City. It takes hours to cross the tilled middle of Pennsylvania, and I'm not alone in this compact rental car. I have a young son in the back seat and a husband sitting next to me who isn't from this country and has never driven into the Allegheny Mountains before. I planned on bringing my family here at some point, once the country was less polarized or after Jean wrote first or after I caved and said a few words to her. I work all day with words, revising them in multiple languages before they move onto websites. And yet these past four years, I haven't been able to move even a single sentence in Jean's direction. Beside me in the car, my husband Gerardo is sighing. The road before us has narrowed to two lanes, and for several miles we've been trapped behind a blue pickup truck with several long plastic tubes rattling around in the back. According to the GPS, it'll now be an additional 12 minutes until we reach Jean's driveway, and conjuring her name has yet to resolve the disquiet in my mind. Each time I say Jean's name to myself, I hear her louder, the rising pleasure in her voice when she read me fairy tales, stopping to insist that she wasn't like the stepmother in Snow White. She had no craving for my liver or my lungs. All I want is to nibble at your heart, Leah, she'd tell me, 
you don't mind if I eat your heart sometimes, right? Just one of the ventricles. I'd play along, tell Jean to eat my whole heart if she was hungry enough. We had such fun slipping bits of ourselves into the savage parts. And um, this is Jean. I'm going to change my persona a little bit so you get the energy because I really very much tried to write these from a different place. I'd had it with the new mailman. He kept peering in at me through the screen door like I was up to something indecent, sculpting cocks like Louise Bourgeois. I didn't have the forging equipment to weld anything cock-shaped. I was no Louise either. I was just trying to master the nature of a box. Everything I made was flat and six-sided, and I didn't need the new mailman snickering at any of it. I also couldn't keep the door shut, not once the metal got molten enough to start releasing its fumes, and the argon gas from the TIG torch was doing its inert magic to the air. I tried to take the high road at first. I said, please, and I called the new mailman by the name on his uniform. I said, Kenny, could you please just leave the mail on the front steps, even if it's pouring? I told him I didn't care if my bills got soggy. Kenny said, sure, and then went on doing exactly what I'd asked him not to, creeping up to the screen door to spy on me. When he got here yesterday, I was sawing the heads off a new batch of spoons. I used the spoon heads for the capsules I started brazing onto my boxes to add a few lumps of surprise to the sides. I knew who at the flea market tended to have silver spoons. They were far softer to saw through than stainless steel. The real fun, though, was choosing what to place inside the spoon heads before I welded the capsule shut. I sealed all sorts of things inside, bits of photos, buds of pine cones, whatever. I damn well pleased. I mean, this is wonderful. I mean, what I love about both these characters is that um, they were both infuriating, and then at the same time, like, so, like, riveting and lovable because they were so themselves, right? And I'm wondering, I love this idea of, like, you sharing your research because I know two things you did. You did the interviews, right? So I want to ask you, what was something surprising that you learned in the process of interviewing people in the communities that you were having these conversations. Did anything surprise you from that process? Absolutely. I didn't expect to write about estrangement, but it kept coming up in the interviews. And I think, I mean, there were people I'd known my whole life, and it just kept coming up of people feeling estranged from neighbors, from siblings, from children, from relatives of these places that, you know, they used to go and sort of were worried about how interactions were going to go. and. Um, I didn't expect that, and it was really, um, it was like, there, it, nobody had words for it. It was like this, it was sort of allude to the estrangements, but didn't want to name them. And I think that's always a good sign for literature, right? Like, we want to write about the ineffable, the things that we can't name, because that's what we want art to do. So um, I think that's how I figured out. It was like this thing that, it's like this energy, you know, that was like this pool, uh, like a vortex, was this issue of estrangement, and I couldn't find any books about it, you know, and um, I, so I decided that that was something that um, I wanted to write about, like, well, what, how, what is this, like, a toll on uh, our family members, on neighbors, on, um, and on the art we make when um, we are inclined to dismiss other people, so. You're also writing about disenfranchisement and the ways these cities, right, like, are kind yeah. of falling because of systemic changes, right? So I'm curious, like, in thinking about estrangement, it's also an estrangement of a time, yeah. right? Like, I feel like I felt that there's this feeling of something lost, and in some ways, like, Jean's story in particular, it's like trying to keep it, like holding it. Yeah, this is the, you said that so beautifully. So there was a f funny moment sometimes. So there was a marine biologist named Enrique Sala, and he was writing and sort of documenting about the sort of death of the ocean. And then suddenly he realized that he didn't want to write an obituary for the ocean. He didn't want to spend the rest of his life charting, you know, the death of what he loved. And um, so he decided he wanted to create this thing called the living seas. And he was writing the future of the ocean and imagining how to save the ocean mm -hmm. and what the future of the ocean would look like. And he just felt sort of I think, sort of resurrected spiritually by doing that. And as soon as I read that, I was like, oh, that's why I didn't write about Appalachia earlier. Because I'm not going to add to the ridiculous sort of 
in t tendency to write about life in the Allegheny Mountains as obituary and as elegy. There's, I mean, my family's alive. Everyone's there is alive. They're finding uh, creative, fabulous ways to live, carve out beautiful lives and creative lives. And um, I, I wanted to write about that. I didn't want to write anything that would be read as an obituary. I wanted to write about somebody resurrecting so the actual post-industrial discards of that area and making something new. So that was um, important to me. Yeah, I felt that. I felt the love you have for this community and these characters and even when they're in very difficult situations, like I still felt like it was fueled with that kind of energy. Um, okay, the other part of the research which I find very interesting is that you actually took welding classes. Okay, so Jean, is a, she's a welder, right? And you went and you took welding classes. What did you learn? Why did you think that was necessary? Well, I really wanted to learn how to torch things. <laughs> that was very necessary. <laughs> Um, and I think the other thing that was really necessary was, so um, my family has a, has a, not I personally, people, Novies who are not me, have a scrapyard in Clearfield, Pennsylvania. And so I, my namesake, Ida Novi, founded the scrapyard in 1906. So I always, because I'm the only one in the family with her name, and she actually never learned to read or write in English. And I'm the only one named for her, so it was kind of this curious thing that the only one named for her, all I do is read and write in English, you know, and she never learned to do. So I felt like I had to do something with scrap metal with all my reading and writing in English because my namesake didn't do that. So I just, and so I think I really wanted to learn how to, you know, weld with scrap metal. And I, I work with three different welders. One was the woman who's the only female member of the welders union in Brooklyn that fixes the bridges, Julia Murray. And then I also worked, um, uh, with a guy named Dan at the Center for Metal Arts in Johnstown, and also with Norm Ed, who's a um, mixed media artist in town who does a lot of metal work himself. And so all of them went about making a box differently. And I thought that was so interesting because I had this idea that Jean would make boxes the way she had been put in boxes her whole life. And so she would sort of torch her own boxes and put in the light that she wanted to put in. And so that was something I was thinking about. And I did not expect that everyone who would teach me to make a box would have a different idea about how to go about it. So. But what about the actual practice of making, right? Let's say you've been writing for many, many, many years. I don't want to say how long. <laughs> this is very long. I like many. That's good. Yeah. Many, many years. <laughs> And, um, but now you're doing something else with your hands. Like how did that inform your writing practice if it did at all? That's a great question. I think what was really helpful, one, because it, well, it was so fun, um, but also because I learned the physical challenges of welding and you know like holding some of the power tools I was talking with Stephanie she was like well power tools they're heavy I was like they are heavy and you know so you have to sort of pace when you use them in what order and also you know if you're thinking about like the gauge of the metal if the, it's heavier metal and you're trying to clamp it like there's all these physical factors and I think that actually doing the welding I, I understood how the physical uh, challenges would change the art that Jean would make. And I don't think I would have realized that if I hadn't actually done it. Well, you know, so. I one of the things I've loved about all your books, in particular your last book and this one, is the way you talk about mothering. And it is because there's a way that you write about being a mother that's incredibly physical. But Jean, who is alone in her studio for a lot of the time, it's very physical. And now I understand like how you got that information. I mean, you know, with Leah, it's the mothering. And with Jean, it's like the sculptures, right? It's like those are her babies <laughs> in some <laughs> other way. So it's really interesting to see that play out. Um, uh, you know, um, I was the, the student of Paul Marshall who um, and Grace Paley. And one quote that they both shared, so I thought it was interesting. I'm like, who said it first was writing answers a question that you don't even know you're asking. Yeah. And I'm wondering, um, now that you've written the book, right? You enter it for some reasons, but now that it's written, like, do you feel like you've answered a question that you didn't even know you were asking in the process of writing this book? I think the question was sort of what, how can I write about an artist who sort of shifts the way that I myself think about making art in Appalachia and for and about Appalachia because that was very important to me and I like, sought out doing events. I just came from Cullowhee, North Carolina. I'm going to Kentucky next weekend. Because I think I, when I was in conversation with Norm Ed, this artist in my hometown, I started to think about these questions. 
what would my life have been like had I stayed, you know? And what, what were the drawbacks of leaving or of staying? And I was just thinking about that a lot. Like, what ways would I have been freer? What ways would I have been more inhibited? And anywhere you go or leave, you're, you'll make different choices. So I was just thinking a lot about place and um, how does place inform the art we make and um, who, for whom do we have mercy and whom do we not? you know, and, w and what kind of mercy do you have for yourself or not? So I think it was just thinking a lot about place and how place is, um, you know, shapes what you see and maybe what you don't see. So um, those were questions. And I realize I, I think I have more to, more to write about that. So <laughs> this book maybe was just a start. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I do think too, like, I love the way that you wove in all of these older artists like Agnes Martin and Louise Bourgeois and, um, and also to show that you could be making art your entire life, right, and not get that recognition. So um, could you talk a little bit about, like, why this is important to you that to bring attention to artists that are making outside of the spotlight? I think people on the edges are often doing the most compelling and risk-taking things. And um, maybe because we're sort of both in the center, like in academia, and you see how people can become more careerist, and I don't want to do that. So I think I was drawn to seeing people who are taking risks and meaningful risks and have integrity. And um, so that this book was a way to sort of think about those questions. And Agnes Martin left New York and moved to uh, Santa Fe for a reason, I think she started w thinking about that, you know, that she just needed that space and time. And um, my husband's from Chile, so we go every year to see his family in Chile, and when I'm there, I only speak Spanish, so the only voices I hear in English are the ones I make up. Um, and so I have started all my novels there, because I think in a way, you know, I could, I, the, the, all I hear are those voices because the rest of the day I'm speaking in Spanish. So I think there is a way. I've found ways to seek that out in, in, in some sense. Um, and I think the other thing is, is like we, I don't want to sort of default as an artist to these easy notions we have about who can be the victim and who might leverage power with someone else. It's totally situational. And so for this novel, when I was thinking about Elliot, who is Jean, who I read, her neighbor, you know, their water gets shut off um, in the house. They have to, they, they rely on the water from her spigot. And how water, which is so essential for everything, can puts him on the losing end of a power imbalance. Mm -hmm. And how anyone can end up on the losing side of a power imbalance. And something that w I really wanted to write about in this book was just how Jean, because in many ways she was often, you know, she worked at the local hospital and it was closed down and, her, you know, her husband kind of belittled her and lots of things happened. Her father was, you know, no walk in the park. And so for all these reasons, she never thought of herself as having any power. And so when she's sort of subtly abusing it with this n young man next door, she doesn't recognize it. And so I, I wanted to write, well, wh how does that happen when we sort of default to assuming who has power and who doesn't? And because I think in every life, I mean, for all of us in here, there will be some moment where you could probably demean somebody and get away with it. And do you? And, you know, what does that look like? And who are you if you choose to get away with it and do it? Or to, you know, not. So I think th that's why I think it's interesting about, like, what are those quiet interactions that happen? Because, you know, in Johnstown, there's a lot of things where people, transactions happen that, as I wrote about in the novel, that aren't with money. There are sort of other kinds of transactions. You know, it's like a whole shadow economy. Of, and, and so those, those relationships, I think, create possible ways that sometimes people maybe are doing work they're not compensated for. You know, I, it makes me think about all the different ways that you could enter this novel and all the different audiences you're actually speaking to. Like, in some ways, this is a great novel for people who love mother and daughter stories and, and how difficult it is to connect when you have all that tension. But also the Elliot character, sort of, he's so fascinating and his relationship to Jean is quite titillating, <laughs> actually. It's like a really fun, um, I, for me, it was really fun to read the way that they were, were negotiating being space, especially because they're so different from each other. And um, and I'm curious, like when you're writing, do you ever think about audience? Or like, could you imagine um, a high school student reading this book or like, you know, or some, or do you imagine people in this area reading this book? Like, what do you think about when you think about audience? Oh, and she has the best questions. Thank you so much yeah. for doing this event with me. Um, I think that, you know, one of the early reviews of the book said that they thought it would be a good book for YA audiences and for high schools. And in fact, 
Krista, your high school in fact reached out about, so I'm gonna, I think, talk about this book in September with Woodland Hills, which I'm already excited about. And, um, you know, some other high schools have shown interest. And I would love to talk about with high schools in this area, just because I think that this is where the book is set, and um, it's like a different kind of conversation, you know. Um, sort of, as, as Krista said, you can see the Easter eggs hidden in the book. <laughs> yes. um, so that, that yeah, I, I would like to talk about that, because I think we're at this interesting crossroads about um, thinking about art and who makes it and what age and about what and you know why do we take certain works of art seriously and not others and you know why do we value the art is it about who made it is it about what risks the art takes and 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 I think you know whose art are we celebrating and whose art are we whose art are we dismissing and so that was something I, I really wanted to write about because Jean's sculptures although I did make them up they're fabulous and so <laughs> <laughs> they don't exist but I love them. And um, <laughs> and I think as a part, you know, like I could drive through the Horner Street in these towns, you know, these streets downtown and just think, well, wh who made something, one of those houses? And are we going to raise that house and lose the art inside mm -hmm. and not even know it was there? So that was like a question too. So, you know, sometimes when I'm reading a book, I like to imagine, I, I like to think, oh, this seems like the, the part of the book that was the most fun to write. And I'm curious, what was the most fun to write? in your book, like what aspect of it or what character? I think what was fun and cathartic in a way was just to see Jean and Elliot having a great time together. Those scenes are fantastic, oh, by the way. You. Like, they're really, really great. Well, thank you. I think there's something about, you know, they're making art, they know that there's a chance no one will ever see it, and it doesn't matter because they're, ha they're living their best days, you know? Also, it all seems so dangerous. Yes, <laughs> which is part of the fun, you know? I mean, like, I just, you know, we none of us those are gonna be, I just wanna have good days, you know? And days when you're making something that is exciting and that maybe is a little bit dangerous and you don't wanna get, you know, fume fever or something, but, you know, to sort of survive making something that um, maybe is bigger and wilder than you thought you could ever do with somebody else. Right. And I think that, you know, those unusual friendships, like, I, I wanna stay open to them. It's so easy now to delete um, somebody who does says something that sort of hits you the wrong way. You know, you can delete someone, you can unfollow them, you can block them on your phone. But um, what's the cost of you know being able to do that to people, to dismissing people? What if, what if you keep talking to them and suddenly you're surprised and you had a conversation that you wouldn't have had otherwise? So, so then, what was the most difficult to write? Ah. That's a harder question. Well, I know this book yeah. is an emotional one for you. It was emotional. <laughs> you know, I think the hard thing to write was writing about um, the coming and going and Leah, who in some ways you would say is similar to me, but in many ways is not. She's younger than I am. She sort of comes back to this country a good decade after I came back, so it was a very different time politically. And um, I find Leah was hard to write. You know, uh, y y she's just, in many ways, not like me. And um, I, st I was, you know, lived in Johnson until I was, went to college and came back regularly. And, you know, I talked to my mother and my stepmother every day. So she's not me. So in some ways, because she was close but wasn't, it was really hard to figure out. I didn't want to condemn her or sort of um, judge her. What I really wanted to do is just stay in the scene mm -hmm. and to just be in her physical reactions and you know when she smells something or tastes something you know she eats her peanut butter buckeyes and she's like oh i f i forgot how delicious buckeyes are you know like there's like sensory experiences that take her back to childhood like remembering the creek where she played as a child you know in the duction on the creek like just these moments and i thought that that was the way to sort of stay in the scene and just let the characters inhabit the scene and that the readers just be with those characters and draw their own conclusions. So uh, that was the hard part, was to just really stay in the scene and um, not editorialize. Well, I thought, you know, I know that you um, written recently about fairy tales, but also um, Leah, there's that moment where she's trying to think of Jean like as a fairy tale story, right? And she's like, I know exactly what she would think about me having these thoughts of her kind of a character in a fairy tale. Do you want to talk a little bit about your fairy tales, the influence on the work, how it comes through in the work? Yes, thank you, Angie. I, so I think, you know, it's, I've seen a lot of mentions of fairy tales recently, and I think it's maybe because there's a lot of pressure to be, um, to admit the precarious place our planet is in, and I'm certainly not denying that. Um, but I wanted to think about, well, where are the ways that we can pursue joy, and genuinely pursue joy, pursue connection, pursue art, pursue beauty, and forgiveness, 
and do all of that um, as a writer in a novel. And I think somehow <laughs> matching in as a fairy tale was a way to give my permission, myself permission to do that. Did I need to do that? Maybe not, but somehow I guess for a first novel set here, it was set, now, uh, you know, it was set in the Allegheny Highlands, somehow that was helpful. And I just thinking about a relationship and like dissolving even in a small way, just between two people, their sort of um, indictment of each other. Just, you know, in one small way between two people, that felt like a fairy tale, just to write toward that. So I think there were several reasons. And also because it's a stepmother story, and I think that, you know, there's all these ways that we have these crazy fairy tales about stepmothers. But interestingly, when the Grimm fairy tales were first written, they did not delineate between biological mothers and mothers who came to have children in other ways. That actually was in revisions of the fairy tales that came later, which was fascinating to hear that that was something imposed on the fairy tales. And I thought about that a lot because Jean stepped in with two feet. She stepped in. I mean, that's, I don't know if that's where the root of the word stepmother comes from, but in this case, I think it's true. And, um, you know, she really gave everything she could to being Leah's mother and, and that is who she will always be. Yeah, I mean, I feel like a lot of this book is about defying the stereotypes of this area and also masculinity. I think you really like push back on what does it mean to be a young man in this area. And I'm just curious, like in writing Elliot in particular, like what did you learn about masculinity as you processed his story? Wow, yes. Uh, Elliot, I think is, you know, a lot of young rural men, if you know, are sort of seen to, especially if they dress, you know, Elliot dresses like everyone else around and are probably safest possible clothes for him to wear. He doesn't have the luxury of sharing his opinions. He doesn't have the luxury of going and pursuing a lot of his, uh, you know, interest he may have. He doesn't have a car, he's in water. And so um, Jean sort of makes all these assumptions about who he is. Um, and she is, you know, I don't want to give the, the book away, but then she finds out that she's wrong. And um, I think for me as an author that there is something writing those scenes to slow them down, to be patient, and to let them figure out the ways that their wariness of each other maybe isn't, isn't, isn't necessary. Yeah, no, it was totally, it's, they're so complex and so beautiful. Um, you had said earlier, um, I caught you saying, said, oh, I was writing this book and there's, I realize there's more that I want to say. <laughs> so I'm curious about one, I mean, I don't know what your writing process is like, but for me, I overwrite, and then I have all, this, all these things I don't include in the book. So I'm curious, like, what was written that you took out eventually that maybe you might be willing to share? Or is there a place that you think, oh, wow, I want to go deeper in that and maybe think about future work? Would you mind sharing? Oh, yeah, I mean, I think this book, probably had a thousand pages and I probably cut out, you know, 750. There was just many takes that they're just gone. No. Yeah. Is this true? Because I want my students <laughs> <laughs> to understand what it takes to write a book, right? So yeah. how, actually, how long did it take you to write the book? And probably how five you? years. I mean, I, s I had scenes of this book before I wrote Those Who Knew and then I couldn't find my way in. It was just sort of figuring out what it was I wanted to say. And then I was doing all these interviews and thinking about art in Appalachia and sort of thinking about how in some ways, you know, rural artists, and, and you know, even I, I wrote a profile of an uh, artist in Normand in, in my town, and like finding a home for it was just really interesting to see the, the ways that, you know, larger magazines were not interested, um, and found a great home for it with Orion, so you can read about Norm's four decades of uh, making art in Johnstown is in Orion magazine, and I, um, they, I, I was so happy because the magazine's about the sort of connection between environmental concerns and art, it was the perfect home for it. Angie was your idea, thank you. But in terms of all those pages, I think a lot of it probably was a lot more about welding and I didn't need it all in there, you know? I didn't need to go through the making of a box. I sort of did like a, you know, just take, pared things down and pared and pared down in a lot of scenes. And um, I think, you know, when you're writing scenes, what you really want to have in dialogue is sort of the private logic of each speaker. So that the conversations that I think is compelling to read in a scene is when there's a lot that's, not being said, and so that each line that's being said is, is there's, there's like an undercurrent, you know, there's like a whole river underneath, and that makes for a compelling scene. So to find those moments, those 12 lines of dialogue between the characters, I probably wrote pages and pages until I got to it. Because no one needs you to be like, you're going to take your boots off cold out today. I mean, no one wants to read that. You know, so I, and I, you know, so I just had, it was like, I would have to get, get, get all of that in there and then finally find those like 
few lines that they say to each other that really sort of, you could feel this like charge underneath. I think that um, also I wanted to know, so you did that, but what else did you not write about? Like you had said earlier, I do want to go back to it. You were like, there's something else I want to write about that I didn't get to in this book. What are you thinking about doing next? Do you have a project in mind or something that's emerging from what all the research you did? Yeah, yeah. I, I you know, I, I kind of want to do more. I think something that I, I have invented this town of Sevlik. It was so much work to invent the town and figure out where everything is. And I definitely didn't want it are to be. Going back to Sevlik? <laughs> maybe, maybe. I don't know. It was just so interesting to make up this place that is both so familiar but also kind of invented. And that that was, um, and now I can like see the town in my mind and, and those streets that are like sort of like the streets I know, but also sort of slightly skewed in a way that's kind of freeing um, because I can sort of make things happen on them, you know, like I know where the barber shop that's closed because they end up taking some of the parts of the chairs, the barber chairs from the barber shop that's closed become part of the sculpture. So like, you know, there's all these things that I sort of had to make up for the, for the world of the novel. So I, I, this town's in my head, you know, I think about like, you know, Philip Roth had novels that were all set in the same time. I, th I think that there's a way that it can be really, um, to have this place that maybe I, I, I want to return to as a place now that I made it up. You know, um, do you um, draw pictures? Like, do you do drawings of your town? Have you done that? Um, well, I, d I didn't draw, but I did I weld those boxes. I think that was the closest. I, I maybe, yeah, but I didn't, do you draw? Did well, you? sometimes, no, I'm just asking because I'm about to do uh, a panel with the archives of Toni Morrison, and Toni Morrison used to draw all her towns. So I was curious if oh, you had so images or drawings of your town as a practice or prep work, what we call preparation, right, for yeah, the novel. Yeah, yeah. But um, you just imagine it and you move through it in your mind. So yeah, that maybe that's why I get lost. I should have <laughs> had a map. You might want to do some drawings. <laughs> this I think is, I this is something that's going to, you know, happen now. <laughs> okay, well, I want to open up for questions. Like, does anyone um, have questions? Oh, yeah, there we are. There are questions. Someone has a question over there. Okay, and we can bring up the lights. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I can't wait to read your book. Um, I really care a lot about um, imparting or giving space for individual agency. And there's, there's a small movement that I hope gains greater steam around uh, rural parts of the country where our you know, what we would call economically, you know, distressed or depressed. And I think that a lot of, a lot of what we don't understand about rural people is probably, you know, reflected in your book, but I was wondering if you could share, you know, how that misperception, you know, what can we do to, correct those misperceptions about these people who we don't get? Thank you. I, I'm, I, that's a fantastic question. And I do think when Angie was asking like a driving question in the book, that's definitely was one of them. And uh, where I, I, I teach undergrads at Princeton, and we have students from everywhere, all over the world, but I have only had one student in 10 years who was from a rural public school in Pennsylvania like when I went to, you know, only one. Or never came up in class, which is also possible, because I never brought up having gone to a rural public school myself, because I think I was worried maybe people would think I was less sophisticated or less well-read, because there are all these perceptions of you know people who go to rural public schools. And, um, and I think I had even internalized some of that myself, you know, and probably the ways that, you know, if I'm writing to Krista, because we grew up together, I might say yins, but I certainly wouldn't say it in my fiction workshop. Um, and what is that? I mean, that's like, there's an issue of linguistic subordination there. You know, there's an issue of accents and dialects and things that we um, assign some sort of lower status to them culturally. And how do we address that? And I think that is by writing it and making it and changing it, you know, book by book, sculpture by sculpture, you know. Um, and, and I do think that that's something that is the way forward for art and literature in this country, and especially addressing these divides that I think serve none of us. 
it just diminishes everyone. It diminishes the writer, it diminishes the reader, it diminishes our literature. So, yeah. Thank you. More questions? Yes. Hi, this was, uh, thanks so much. Uh, not only I'm looking forward to reading the book, but I now will hear your voice speaking so fast for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just that it's me. Um, uh, I, I was very uh, interested in what you said that, you know, you're writing the book and you didn't want to editorialize the yourself or the character. I can't remember what you said. Um, it, it, so that uh, is, can you can you talk a little bit about that and how you do the the several different perspectives and uh, you know you know you lost you got lost in your city or in your town yeah. do you get lost in all these characters that you write about? That's a great question. I think I tried to find writers who so an example Claire Keegan she's an Irish writer. But a lot of her her novels are very clean. You know, she doesn't doesn't editorialize or hector or condemn any of the characters. She stays in the scene and she writes these these stories set in rural Ireland, and that's also very politicized. And there's a lot of you know, sort of charged history, right? And um, but yet when you read the scene, it's just these complex characters, and they're all granted equal complexity, and you just get to know them, and it you know you just get to be pulled into the world of their lives and their experiences and, and they stay with you. And so I would read a couple pages of her books. Another writer that was really helpful to me in that regard was reading Elizabeth Strout's My Name is Lucy Barton. And um, because that's about a, a writer who leaves New York and goes back and is sort of thinking a lot about class and the ways you know pe people think about class in the city, the way people think about, see her in a completely opposite contrast to how she's seen in the city when she goes back to the rural community where she grew up of course I related to because <laughs> those trips back and forth. So Lucy Barton, I think that, you know, that, that, that creation from um, Liz Strout was really helpful because again there she didn't editorialize. She just grants all the characters this complexity that um, I think is what literature should do, you know, is that you get to imagine these people who become alive for you and, and you f you they're, what's happening to them feels emotionally true. And then you and you're instinctually can just think about all the all the things that happen there because I don't think that we read in order to judge characters. I don't think that's what we go to literature for. I think we go to it something that's far more complex than that. Over there. I had the opportunity to read Those Who Knew and Ways to Disappear. And I like them both a lot. This book seems very different. Can you tell me how the I how the thought process went through writing. Um, well, thank yeah, you. Yes. So excited to share the new one with you since you read the first two. Thank you. This did feel really different. I think I hadn't read any books about where I grew up. I never, I did never saw any books that were like set. And so there was one book, Joan Chase has this novel that's set in rural Ohio called The Last Reign of the Queen of Persia. It has nothing to do with queens in Persia, but it's just a bunch of women on a farm and they find these small sort of discreet ways to enjoy things on their own terms, even though no one really wants them to. And I read that book like five times, because I, I couldn't find anything that sort of did that. And Toni Morrison's books, set in Ohio, are also true. But, um, you know, those are taking on sort of different issues, because, you know, I, did, I didn't grow up black in Ohio. I grew up sort of like white and Jewish in Johnstown. So there were some ways that they were very helpful, but also, you know, she was, I, I think her evocation of, the, of the place and time and certain tensions, like I, I love reading Toni, Toni Morrison. And Joan Chase was like closer in terms of thinking about um, this closed group of people. Because Toni Morrison's books have a large cast. There's a lot of people in them. But this was just these small group of people. And I, it took me a while, I think, to figure out where I was gonna find these books to get to this book. And I think I just needed to live more. I think I needed to get a little older. I think I was, I was just thinking about this recently was that when I had something when I was younger and my parents came, my dad and my stepmother came to see me in New York and my dad was talking to an editor or something he did and he's like, we're hillbillies. And I turned around, <laughs> Krista knows, she, you can imagine my dad saying that, right? And I was like, dad, I can't bring you if you say things like that, you know? <laughs> I was just floored, you know? 
And then all these years later, I do think it's funny, you know, maybe because, you know, I, I, I lost my dad this year, but I also think that um, there was a way that it took me a long time to be able to be like, I came from a rural place and guess what? It's okay. It doesn't mean that I'm less, you know, capable of making serious literature. I don't have to apologize for having, well, I don't know, not gone to a wealthy boarding school. I, you know, do, 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 so I think it took me a long time to sort of just feel sort of what they call proprioception which is like when you have this like inner eye and even if you close your eyes, you know where you are. And I think as a writer, it took me a while to have that proprioception. Thank you, maybe one more question? We'll pass that back down to you. Hi, this isn't really literature related, but more first your name, Idra, from Ida. Yeah. How did that happen? And then because she had the metal scrap yard, is that what made you interested in the welding? Was there welding in the family or people took things from the scrap yard to do that? Thank you, yeah, so my namesake Ida Novi, I was named Idra. I think um, my parents just thought they were modernizing it, I guess, by adding the R. Um, I don't know, I wasn't, I was think I, couldn't couldn't access exactly what the thinking was. They were a little foggy on. They were foggy on this why where Idra came from because I've never met another one. Um, so who knows exactly what was going on? But that happened. Maybe they were sleep deprived. I don't know. <laughs> um, but anyway, here I am. I, you know, and, and so I'm the only Idra I've ever met. And I think that that um, also connected me to Ida because you know if I was one of like many people in the, in the family with the name, but I felt this connection to her, and so. Um, I wanted to do something, but the, the, the scrapyard was um, patrilineal, so it went from my great-grandfather, you know, they gave it to their son, who gave it to his son, who gave it to his son, so it just went down like the men. So I have no material connection to the scrapyard. So I think that this novel, for me, was a way to invent that inheritance creatively. You know. Well, we're glad you did. Thank you for recreating scrap yards, making this beautiful book, having a beautiful conversation Thank you, with Angie, Angie Cruz. Let's hear it again for Idra Nelby.